Alex, good evening from him and good evening from me. Uh, welcome, everybody. So have we got uh, planning news for you. Uh, Charlie Banner here uh, in number five chambers, Bristol, with uh, Chris, who happens to be uh, here too. Um, we're, we're here for an event in, in Bristol later on. Uh, we're delighted you can all join us. As, as always, um, please do consider a charity donation in, view, uh, in, in lieu of a um, registration fee. Uh, the charities we support are Shelter, uh, Brian May's Save Me, Champions of the Environment, and of course, more recently, the GoFundMe Ukraine page. Um, we're delighted to have as our special guest this evening in a, the most austere, uh, dignified surroundings, Baroness Neville Rolfe, um, now the chair of the House of Lords Built Environment uh, Committee, whose report, Meeting Housing Demand, was published to, to great acclaim in January. And we're really looking forward, uh, Baroness Neville Rolfe, to, to discussing that report with you. Obviously, if you have to go and vote in the meantime, feel free to, to do so. <laughs> um, and um, so with that, let's introduce the, the panel. Um, who are you? Well, uh, my name, Charles, is Christopher, and uh, I'm in the same room as you. Uh, he's already explained where I am, so I don't need to do that. Why have we got the house here? Because I've decided to let Charlie run with my house in the London Marathon this year in aid of shelter. I, I can't do the London Marathon, so he's going to run in it. Although my son's had the great idea that we should keep on the stickers that say Chris, so when he runs round, everybody shouts, come on, Chris and uh, that'll just frustrate him enormously um and uh, you're you're going to tell us about the theme baroness because we're oh, yes, quite interested in the theme tell us yes what have you chosen our theme and what if anything are you drinking if you're allowed to drink in such dignified surroundings well i can't drink because i'm in the queen's gallery and that would be les <laughs> murphy's day um what's this <laughs> anti-back um, <laughs> if i get desperate um my theme is more housing and fewer housing ministers. Um, and I should perhaps add that when I was at school in Cambridge, I used to raise money for shelter and used to do runs for shelter all those years ago. So if you send me an email, I'll, I'll sponsor you. Thank you very much. That's very kind. We, we certainly will. Um, Mary, how are you? Uh, Good evening. Good evening. Um, I, I'm most amused to see you sitting there next to each other, both in your in your um, looking very smart in your black ties. And you wouldn't believe where I am. I'm actually in Landmark Chambers uh, for the show. Thank you very much, Landmark. But uh, um, as our regular viewers will know, um, I'm a partner in Town Legal, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to the show. And welcome, Baroness. Thanks, Mary. Sasha, are you also, are we two pairs for people in the same building today? We are. I am. I'm exactly two floors above Mary, which is delightful. <laughs> um, so I'm in central London. And I, for those viewers of a slightly older vintage, you two are doing a, a bloody good impression of Hale and Pace. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the, the world's most ineffective bouncers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and for, if Chris and I are in the same building and Sash and Mary are in the same building, Paul, presumably you're in the House of Lords. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's another name for the offices of uh, Bracknell Council, which is where <laughs> I <I'm laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's where the House of Lords will decamp to when uh, when the repairs take place. Who knows? This may be the Queen's Gallery. Who can I say? <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's a delight to see you, Baroness. Uh, uh, tragically, I'm not in the same building as you. I've just literally walked out of an inquiry and I seem to have entered an episode with the Chuckle Brothers. It's really <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Paul. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm drinking water because I, I am doing a housing appeal for a housing developer. Yeah. Therefore, existentially, I've got the theme going, but I couldn't extend that to water, which is just Waitrose water. Uh, <laughs> well, I should say I'm, I'm drinking... Um, uh, it's actually not blue moon. It's a blue moon Spitfire ale given given to me by a a consultant on affordable housing, no less, less who's who's hosting my table tonight. Um, so we're going to talk about um, four four cases before we get to our discussion with uh, Baroness Everos. As I say to every guest, um, please do um, chip into the discussion um, on these cases. Anything is interest to you. Look, one or two housing cases, starting with one that Mary's going to tell us about: a uh, exceptional circumstances in the A O N B in Tunbridge Wells for a uh, significant housing scheme. So over to you, Mary. Thank you very much. And indeed, um, this, this appeal concerned uh, a greenfield site, as you say, on the southern edge of Hawkehurst in the uh, high wheeled AOMB. And uh, it was agreed between the parties that um, the proposal was for major development. There you are, you can see the front, front of this. And it's, uh, as you can see, a very recent um, decision following a 
um, virtual inquiry. And this site was proposed for allocation in the emerging plan, which had been submitted for the examination at the time of the inquiry. And um, the, there was a prematurity objection that was rejected. But the main issue uh, was if effectively the engagement of paragraph 177 of the uh, National Planning Policy Framework, whether exceptional circumstances exist to warrant its development, uh, major development in the AOMB, uh, and whether that would be in the public interest. And of course, in the end, the inspector found, um, and on balance, yes. So just digging into it a bit, in a bit more detail, the inspector had to consider the effect on the character and appearance of the AOMB and found that um, he was dealing with a relatively uh, enclosed site, which still had a relationship with a wider area. He found that there were demonstrable adverse impacts, but that with regard to the AOMB management objectives, um, overall, the effect would be neutral because there was uh, some beneficial as well as some slightly adverse uh, uh, effects. And I think one of the really important points is his words, the appellant had gone to great lengths to moderate harm and that the scheme was a well thought out landscape led design. And Rob, I wonder if you could just um, put up on the screen for us the um, plan. There we go. So you can see uh, that in terms of the density of, of, of the site, there were sort of pockets of development surrounded by large areas of landscape um, and quite a lot of new trees were, were proposed um, around the, the immediate sort of pockets or clusters of development. So, so that's the scheme. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, he also, uh, so in the end, he, he came to the view that, that there was moderate to low residual harm in, in the long term in terms of the AOMB, but relatively low visual impacts. Uh, and obviously the design was key in that. He also had to consider the effect on heritage assets. And there were um, three grade two listed buildings and their, the, their settings to consider and the settings of two conservation areas. So five heritage assets less than substantial harm at the low end of the spectrum for two of them, and very low end, less than substantial harm in respect of the other three. So applying the 202 MPPF balance, um, I gather most both parties agreed that the benefits clearly outweighed the, the harms. The highway reason for refusal wasn't in the end defended, and that's because there were off -site, an off-site mitigation scheme was agreed with Kent County Council as Highway Authority. Interestingly, there was a roundtable discussion because the Parish Council obviously didn't accept that. And I thought of particular interest was the Parish Council's point that the baseline traffic flows in 2021 were too low because basically they were COVID, um, they were COVID traffic flows for want of a better expression. And what the inspector said was this, there's no evidence before me to suggest that traffic now has returned to pre-COVID levels or that it will in the future, particularly bearing in mind the changes to home working practices. So he rejected the parish council's concerns. Interestingly, um, the fact that there was a housing shortfall was agreed. In this particular case, they argued about the extent of it and it was 4.75 versus 4.23. Now, why, you might wonder, did they bother doing that answer because it was major development in the AOMB? And um, the council won a few uh, points. They won the windfall allowance point. Uh, they won the no small site non-implementation rate, but the appellant also won some points. And so overall, it was a 4.61 uh, shortfall. And in answer to the, really to the question of uh, whether there were exceptional circumstances, important was the fact that the council accepted that there would needed to be greenfield um, development in the OMB to meet housing needs. That even then they couldn't actually in their local plan meet all their identified needs. And that um, although there were harms to heritage, Brackets, uh, brackets, he didn't spell out how much weight he give, gave to those heritage harms, but we, he, although there were those harms, uh, he was clear that the benefits of the proposal um, clearly um, outweighed um, any uh, adverse effects that he'd identified. He was also clear that there was absolutely no reason 
um, clear reason to refuse, either on the basis of impacts on the AOMB or heritage. And he also found that, um, in fact, the, the, the proposal overall complied with the development plan because there was a development plan policy which admitted to major development if exceptional circumstances were, were, were found. So, all in all, a very good result. Oh, and a minor point of detail, listeners, guess who was the acting for the appellant? Our good friend here, young CB. So Thank well you. done, Charlie. Well done, Thank Charlie. You know, the previous captain, Chris, who couldn't do the inquiry. So indeed, uh, well, wow. but no. And so congratulations to the great people at Define who who designed that truly exceptional scheme. Who deserve all the credit, really. Um, really, you know, well done to them. Now, um, Chris, you're going to tell us about a case in Burnham on Crouch. I am. I am. Well done to last one. Uh, excellent scheme, if I may say so. Um, so I've got an appeal decision here. I don't know if Rob's got the. T title page. This is a decision from uh, Owen Woodwards. We've seen a number of decisions uh, from him. Um, this is a proposal by Think Green L Land. And uh, what it is, is a proposal for a retirement uh, community, 232 units. But this is C2. They weren't arguing for C3. So uh, this isn't extra care. This is uh, uh, conventional housing, but just age restricted in terms of who can occupy it. Um, and the appeal was allowed, and the appeal was allowed with costs. So how did all that unfold? Well, um, this was a greenfield site. It was unallocated, um, but the council has a 2.92 year supply of housing. So a desperately large shortfall, a desperate shortfall, a large fall, shortfall, an acute housing position. And um, the only reason for refusal that the members could come up with was residential amenity. But the officers said there was no harm. So uh, the members refused it on the basis um, of nothing more than um, there'd be an effect and a change on the view. Well, that is not a very substantial reason for refusing a proposal. In cross-examination, the local planning authority accepted the change in view was not a material consideration. This was not going well, was it? Uh, and accepted no harm to amenity by virtue of overshadowing, overbearing, overlooking privacy or anything. So not even a material consideration, and that's what the members had refused it on. Um, and the position in terms of landscape and visual harm uh, accepted it was localised, accepted in cross-examination it was minor, right at the bottom of the scale, uh, no more than would be expected of any greenfield site, and in fact the site was less visually intrusive than would otherwise ordinarily be inspected, expected. So um, absolutely minor harm caused uh, to the landscape and to the visual impact, and no amenity case. So, unsurprisingly, the inspector awards costs. He noted that the uh, tilted balance was correctly identified in the officer's report. No criticism of the officers here. Uh, the proposal's harms, as set out in the council's report, were minor adverse effects. And um, listen to this. In the cost decision, paragraph 17, the proposal should not have been refused in the first place, said the inspector, and should not have been actively defended at the appeal. This is particularly galling, galling in light of the council's agreed housing land supply of only 2.92 years. So interesting that the inspectors feel able to express what is just an absolutely shocking position, frankly, from the council. Reminds me of Dominic Young's uh, view about uh, Uttlesford, which we covered a, a couple of months ago where he said the plan was painfully out of date. I don't think there's anything wrong with using these adjectives. Galling is how this decision is described. I think we've got the list of appearances at the end. And uh, here we can see this was another case successfully achieved by Sarah Reid. I am fast turning into Sarah Reid's PR consultant. Um, uh, just tell me what you're doing next week, Sarah, and I'll try and cover that as well. <laughs> Uh, but well done, fantastic result, very effective cross-examination. The inspector made an important mistake, though, and that was that, uh, I'm sorry um, if you're watching, Mr Woodwards, you do have to record the fact that Sarah Reid is a QC, and uh, at the date of your decision, she's a QC, so that's just one mistake in the decision. I don't imagine that's going to lead to a legal challenge.
<laughs> thanks, thanks, Chris. One of, one of several women QCs appointed a couple of weeks ago, which is great news. Now, um, we go from the southeast England to the northwest and Stockport. There's only one person who cover that decision, <laughs> the king of the north. But in, in, in fairness, going back to the, uh, the, the Burnham decision that you've just done, that's now the second week on the bounce that we've had a Sarah Reid case. Uh, it's the second Sarah Reid case that I had to return to her because I couldn't do it because of timescales. And the second one, she's absolutely slam dunk. So we had Roche for last week. So I, I think not only are you are the PR consultant, Chris, but she's fast making me redundant. P- yeah. uh, well, Paul, 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 I feel your pain. We've talked about two of Charlie's cases, both of which are mine. Okay, So I feel your pain. What's, what's even better, though, Chris, is that when the case was returned to Sarah, I absolutely assured the client that Sarah was not only brilliant, but she was almost certainly going to take silk. So I win. I win. Yeah. On that one. I wish I put money on it. Um, so my case is a, another logistics scheme, this, one, this time in Stockport. And the circumstances are interesting. It's a decision of Mr. Inspector Rose on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, following an inquiry which took place relatively shortly before then, uh, the previous month. Uh, It's a dismissed appeal. It was a scheme in the green belt, but the circumstances are unusual. Um, You will recall from last year uh, that Stockport decided to declare UDI from Greater Manchester uh, and left the Greater Manchester strategic framework. Well, this is a site which had originally been allocated uh, in an early draft of the Greater Manchester strategic framework for employment use, an extension of the Bredbury uh, industrial estate. Um, and the Greater Manchester Strategic Framework had looked at Greenbelt and produced a piece of work which considered the issue of uh, the extent to which the site performed Greenbelt functions. Well, the inspector revisited that work and gave it limited weight because it related to the strategic framework, which now has nothing to do with Stockport. Um, and essentially considering in Greenbelt terms that there was very subst- well, there was substantial Greenbelt harm in a number of respects, including issues of coalescence. Um, so in terms of the greenbelt harm, it was sort of getting towards the top end. In landscape terms, um, in, in character terms, there was, by the inspector, considered to be quite a significant effect on the Tame Valley, uh, the River Tame, uh, which has a certain protection in, in that neck of the woods. And in character terms, unacceptable. And in visual terms, notwithstanding a buffer of about 20 to 30 metres, uh, although that would have some effect on uh, people looking at the, this relatively large scheme, it's 100,000 square metres, half of which uh, in full, half of which in outline. Uh, the inspector really wasn't impressed about how effective that would be. The other interesting thing was that the inspector did give weight to the uh, appellant's uh, employment land work uh, and quite substantial weight to that, but then put in a caveat to say to Stockport, but none of the work that I find demonstrates there's a need for this sort of work uh, this sort of uh, development should be binding on Stockport in terms of its local plan. So it finds that it's fine, it's uncontradicted, but it's it's not, it doesn't bind Stockport. And overall, the inspector concluded that very special circumstances weren't demonstrated. The interesting thing was um, that Stockport didn't call live evidence with regard to um, uh, either employment need or in relation to landscape. Um, they simply relied upon a report. And in relation to employment need, they said, well, we're leaving that all to our local plan, so that we're not going to prejudice ourselves and we're not going to engage in that. The irony is that Stockport therefore paid a bit of a forensic blinder because the appeal is dismissed on the grounds of not demonstrating Greenbelt. And although the inspector found that there was a need, plainly Stockport could go to their local plan and say, we never engaged in that debate and our evidence was never scrutinised in that regard. Therefore, we can demonstrate whatever they're saying is their emerging plan. So it's, it's a, a forensic oddity, um, but it is a case where, um, unlike the other cases, in the, most of the other cases in the Northwest, uh, that this was a case where Greenbelt uh, harm wasn't outweighed by employment need. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Darling. And in another apt uh, scripting, we now got a case about a tall building in Tower Hamlets, and there's one of us who knows a thing or two about <laughs> tall buildings in Tower Hamlets, Mr. Sasha White, QC. Yeah. Lucky, it's lucky that two people knew something about tall buildings in, in Hamlets, myself and Mr. Prentice. But anyway, um, yes, I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about this case, which is another attempt to get a very tall building, 25 stories in Tower Hamlets, and it was an appeal that was held in January, a virtual inquiry, and the decision came out on the 17th of March. And the two key battlegrounds in the decision were effectively character and appearance and the proposed 
amenity space. Now, I think what's critical about this is is remember the context. This is a site, obviously, highly sustainable in the centre of London, just on the edge of Millwall, in a dock. And I think what's really important about it for those watching is the inspector reaches some quite significant conclusions on design and summed up in paragraph 22, where the inspector says the proposal, in my view, have a dominating effect on the street scene on the west side of Millwall in a dock. And it would fail to take account of the existing and emerging immediate context and surroundings. And as a result, considered cumulatively with a consented scheme nearby, it would have an overbearing and overly dominant effect, which would cause harm to the character and appearance of the area. So I think it, it shows that inspectors, frankly, are putting, I think, increasing weight on design. It shows that they're, as Chris has highlighted a moment ago, they're willing to take on to be more forthright than ever about criticisms of a scheme that they think particularly fails design criteria and policy. And I think the, the, the other thing that is important is about amenity space and the conclusion there that there were concerns regarding the proposed outdoor amenity space. Overall, I mean, one thing which is also noteworthy, however, um, is that the inspector concludes the development would fail to provide a development which is human in scale at street level, mm -hmm. and it would conflict with numerous policies in the development plan as a result of those design criticisms, which would effectively mean that it would fail to accord with the development plan as a whole. So I think this is part of a series of decisions we've seen recently where design is absolutely at the forefront and the benefits, obviously, of a 25-storey residential um, proposal were clearly and conclusively outweighed by the concerns the inspector had about design. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Sasha. Uh, another interesting uh, design refusal indeed. So we move now to our interview with Baroness Neville Rolf, uh, which, which I'm going to kick off. Uh, and thank you once again, uh, Baroness Neville, for, for joining us. And um, before we talk about um, your committee's recent report, perhaps you could just tell our viewers a little bit more about what is the Built Environment Committee's remit? Uh, uh, and why was it set up in the, in the first place? Um, it was set up last year, the Built, um, the, the Built Environment Committee's report. Um, and it was, it was part of a move to move to more thematic committees, um, perhaps going beyond a single government department. You'll know that the Commons committees tend to parallel a department and are very concerned. But on something like infrastructure and building, actually a lot of the issues and problems are cross-departmental. So I think the House of Lords very imaginatively set up this committee, and it's a permanent committee, uh, to, to tackle just that. And we're co we cover housing, we cover planning, we cover transport and infrastructure. And it's a cross-party committee, uh, and it's got you know, a mixture of people, some of them very expert, like Lord Best and Lord Barclay, people who will be household names in, in your sector, um, you know, who are there. And actually, we get on incredibly well, which is quite surprising, given um, there's quite a bit of political difference. <laughs> so the question really was, was, there have been various reports on the housing crisis over the last 15, 20 years, as, as your report uh, notes. So um, what, uh, what was the particular problem for, for this uh, inquiry and thereafter report into meeting UK's housing demand? Well, we were a new committee, so we sat down and we decided what were the most important areas. Um, and actually, we came up with two, and one was housing, which actually, I personally, I felt very strongly about because I feel that people, I'm very concerned about the householders and the consumers and the front line, and people need homes, whatever, whatever tenure. And then a lot of people wanted to tackle skills um, because skills were a big problem, not only skills, not only brickies, but skills in town halls, for example, which I'm sure is something you would agree with. Mm. Um, and so what we decided to do was do both. So we did housing and we also did skills at the same time insofar as they relate to housing. And actually, I think that makes for a very rich report, with lots of re useful recommendations. Um, and what we wanted to do was to try and set out, and luckily we got a new Secretary of State right at the right moment, where things were now what the challenges have been and, and makes a sort of number of recommendations, some of which might require legislation, some of which don't, um, about what could be done to actually um, 
get rid of this chilling effect that we felt that the system's been having on something as important to people as housing. Uh, it's clear that, that, that your committee takes the housing crisis very, very seriously, and hence the, the tour de force that you come up with and, and your appearance today. But um, in terms of government, there's a, there's a very striking table early on in the report listing all 17 housing ministers in the 20 years up to the publication of the report. And of course, that was a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, because no sooner was your report published, um, the, the 18th one came along in the form of, of Stuart's Andrew replacing Chris Pincher, who's been moved elsewhere. Um, do you think um, this um, musical chairs is indicative of government not taking the housing crisis seriously enough? And by that, I mean government of all complexions over 20 years, not a yeah. point. Well, I think the short answer is yes. I mean, obviously, total failure. But straight after our report was published, the excellent Chris Pincher got moved on, albeit on promotion, which I was absolutely delighted for with. And if you look back... The um, ones that were there the longest were Yvette Cooper and Grant Shapps. And actually, they've gone on to bigger and greater things. So that's actually probably quite helpful in the great scheme of things. Um, but uncertainty is a real problem. Um, this is a long term matter. Um, and that's led because of the uncertainty, which is, I think, fueled by all these housing ministers. Um, it's led to, you know, withdrawal of local plans. I think we saw Slough being withdrawn this week. Um, and that uncertainty, I think, has had a chilling effect. I mean, this is not the only area of public policy where we've had a chilling effect. I, I dealt with nuclear when I was energy minister. Um, and that's now moved forward a little bit. Um, but again, so what on the plus side, this government had a 300,000 300, home target in their manifesto. Um, and we think that we need to do quite a few extra things, as you will have seen from the report, if we're going to, if we're going to hit that target, which possibly, if you look at the demographics, it's not actually high enough. Mm. Uh, on this uncertainty, I mean, the report calls uh, in very uh, um, striking terms for, for clarity on planning reforms and the um, future nature of the planning system. Uh, and my question for you, Baroness Dimonov, in this respect, is this, is given the cyclical nature of politics and, and indeed the habitual tinkering with the planning system by politicians, will we ever get the necessary clarity? <laughs> I think it's a very political area and it is right that there is community engagement and sort of democratic accountability on something that affects people's lives so much. So I'm not against that. Um, I think you can have clear policy direction. Um, and I think you can make sure that there aren't too many resource holes. So, you know, set out what you want to do and then as it were, resource it up properly in the councils and in the town halls. I've been particularly frustrated um, as you know about the lack of progress of smaller schemes because I think the bigger schemes, because they're going to produce more houses, tend to be given priority by the planners. Um, so we need to do something about that. Um, and, you know, government should try, you know, it's great. Gove is a great person who comes and reviews things, but he needs to have a look. Then he needs to decide. And then I think, we, you know, whatever he decides, we don't need to stick to it for a bit so that the house builders, large and small, can get on. Mm. And, and on, on the subject of getting on, the report comes down heavily in favour of speeding up the, the local plan plan making process. Not that there could be any slower. To <laughs> be honest. Um, and um, what's your view on, on whether local plans can be adopted quickly enough under the existing system without significant reform? Bearing in mind there's sort of hints that we may not get the, the reform previously foreshadowed in the white paper. Now, are there any easy wins that, that don't require fundamental restructuring of the system? Well, I think I would say that you do have to, if you're going to have a plan-led system, I mean, that was George Young, who had a rather good question this week, actually, on our housing target, um, brought in the plan-led system, because when he reviewed the area, he thought it was necessary. Now, if you, you know, you don't have to have a plan-led system, but if you have got a plan-led system, then you can't make it unworkable by allowing more than half of councils not to have up-to-date local plans. I mean, it just is ridiculous. Um, you know, so you've got, you know, and, but I think you can tackle it bit by bit. 
Um, so obviously we've got the local elections coming up, so nothing much is going to happen until the second week of May. Um, but after that, I think you can have a look. Um, you, you, know, you can say what's needed for housing, what's needed for infrastructure, um, you know, what's needed for the environment, because one of the problems which didn't come up on your cases today, but has been natural England decisions on environmental matters, uh, slowing things down. You know, some, some of the points that they make are good, but um, it's also a part of, the, part of the problem. And then the other thing that we found, which I'm interested in people's views on, is that the system is too complex and detailed. Um, and we would like to have a clearer system to reduce planning risk. And for example, could you have standardized definitions and simply cut-fied guidance for planning authorities so that it was easier for them to do the plans uh, and get them up to date? It, it seems for somebody who comes from business, and I think many of you know that I, I, I spent 15 and a half years at Tesco, where mm. sort of simpler, you know, better, cheaper were big principles. And that doesn't really seem to apply to the, um, to the planning system, unfortunately. Um, so can we, can we have some clear direction and can it be clear? And I mean, that's not necessarily wonderful for the planning bar because clearly your great, brilliant yeah. complexity <laughs> is, is a very important part of the system. But I'm sure you want to build homes as much as I do. Not that it's simply better cheap, but more complex, worse, and more expensive. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the latter. Um, then, uh, you mentioned some SMEs and their role. I'm going to come to them in a moment. But if I may, just pausing on, uh, on that, looking at the volume house bills, the PLCs and the like. Uh, now, the report has some very useful statistics in there. I think you say that the, the big house builders build in the region of 150,000 homes a year and the top four loan, um, 60,000 a year. Um, but they're facing numerous additional pressures on all fronts, as has been reported in the show us where cladding remediation, potentially billions of pounds, carbon efficiency measures, um, the air sourced heat pumps, nutrient neutrality, phosphate mitigation, doing the job of the water undertakers, paying farmers to take down down agricultural use because of nitrates issues, toughened up approaches to assessment of viability, more exacting design standards, higher corporation tax. You know, in isolation, each of these things maybe seem to be very noble measures. Um, but it, is there a risk that the, the simultaneous or near simultaneous accumulation of these things mm. Risk sort of killing the goose that <coughs> laid the golden egg, or mixing my metaphors, the risk risk introducing a straw that breaks the camel's back, and thereby slowing down housing delivery by by those best placed to deliver um, half the identified national need. Well, I think you make a very good point, and and that is always the trouble. I mean, people put through these different reg regulations for good reasons, um, although sometimes I think better enforcement of existing rules might be better. Um, and then you get the problem that we've got. And as you say, you, if you look to that list, you might think, God, why don't I move into a different sector? However, that isn't what the construction and house building sector are like. They're very entrepreneurial and doughty. Um, but I think we felt that sorting out the local plan system would be a very good way of helping them, especially house, house builders beyond the, beyond the big four. Um, but the big four have got obviously perhaps more challenges than anyone. But then they've obviously got more resources there, anyone. And on the skills side, we found that they lacked, there was a less, they, were, they had better skill supply and expertise because they have good training schemes and so on. Um, but, you know, and then, there, are, there are blockages and the planning system is slowing things down. If you could speed it up, you know, on the right lines, I, I mean, I'm not asking for sort of ridiculous, the wrong sort of tall, tall building, badly designed in the wrong place to pick up one of the cases that we were talking about. That, that's not going to go. But the right buildings, we should move them ahead. You'll, you'd actually get a growth bonus if you could speed things up, a once-off growth bonus, which we really need in the country at the moment. And then uh, uh, what about SMEs? And you, you, the report acknowledges the potential for increased role by SMEs, which the bright paper did too, and, and you call for a fast-track planning for them. Can you elaborate what sort of specific measures for SMEs you have in mind as to get to yeah. give, start to them? Yeah, of course. I mean, the issue is a very simple one. In 1988, it was one in four homes, four out of 10 homes was built by SMEs. Now it's just one in 10. I mean, that is really bad in my view. 
Um, and there are three key things that we discovered. Um, one is access to finance. And to be fair, the government have done something about their levelling up funds. So that may help a bit. And there is quite a sort of good political battle in relation to SMEs, which may be favourable. Secondly, is availability of small sites. And third, I think at worst, is the planning risk and delay. Because the bigger, I know this from being a director, bigger companies can afford to wait and they can afford to lose one out of three planning applications. The small guys can't do that, or the small girls. Um, and so the, the risk capital is a big problem. Um, so that's why um, we think there should be a fast track planning process for SMEs. Uh, I mean, the parallel for me, I came, I worked at Tesco, as I was saying, and we used to have a special fast track process for small suppliers who just supplied a small, a small area like half of Wales or, or Cornwall or whatever, because we wanted to take their products because they were very innovative. We want to actually help them grow, but there's no way that they could supply pay, you know, pet pasties or whatever to the whole of the UK, which was how the whole system was geared. Um, and I think we should do something a bit similar through planning. I think master developer model can help because you've got the master developer, they can have you know, a patch for a couple of smaller operators. And we think there might be a role for Homes England. Um, and actually the government, insofar as people, government has responded to our report positively, I thought the, the noise on SMEs was, was pretty positive. So I'm going to have to keep them up to the mark. <laughs> on, on delays, I mean, SMEs often tend to pursue the kind of mid size schemes that if they don't get consent from local authority, when they go to appeal, the planning inspector put them towards the hearing procedure rather than the more complex inquiry procedure. But the, the current average turnaround time for these hearing appeals, are typically involving SMEs, is over a year. I mean, it, it, it is, is a year's a year to determine a planning appeal, in your view, an acceptable period of time for the planning inspector to take? Well, I think the answer is it depends on the scheme. I mean, if you've got a very complicated scheme, as long as you know it's going to take a year and you've got the funding, that's fine. But that, you know, the smaller schemes don't need to take a year. I mean, for household schemes, I think it was 13 weeks. So I remember working on bringing these targets in when I was a civil servant. Um, mm. But what you're talking about is actually the perverse effect of a target. I think it's the Rosewall target, which has then affected this other procedure mm. because you're prioritizing a different thing. Um, I mean, the, I think it's easier for the bigger householders to wait for the reasons I described earlier. I think there's also something we probably need to do in relation to either 106 or the new infrastructure levy, wherever we end up. I think those things cause delay and also uncertainty. I mean, 106 has sort of got bit degraded over the years because it was meant to give a certain share and community advantage from a scheme but the way it works in practice is there's a lot of challenges to the detail on viability grounds and then that ends up with delaying the thing but also not giving you the sort of scheme you need with the infrastructure being put in to a housing estate at the same time as the building which is what is ideal. Mm. Last question for me before I have to have the panel. Bill to rent. As I read the report, um, it, it was slightly equivocal, and I don't mean that critically, as to whether build to rent is additive to or cannibalistic of delivery of homes to own. I, is that fair? And, and what's your view uh, in relation to this? Yes, yeah, yeah, so I, I think we got evidence from both sides. So we, we didn't give a very strong uh, recommendation. We might come back to it. We're actually looking at Airbnb and other short term lettings at the moment. Um, and I think it has, you know, build to rent has got a part to play. I mean, I think the sort of LNG type um, schemes that you're beginning to see now in county towns and things um, are actually a good idea. And they're often very good quality buildings as well, uh, which matters these days. Mm, indeed. Um, Sasha, um, you're next on my screen. So I'll pass over to you. What, what's your question? Thank you very much. My question is, I mean, having read the report, I think the recommendations are absolutely superb. And as I've said to you previously, for once, one reads a report about the world we inhabit and actually thinks spot on, you've understood the system. But I just wondered, can you tell us how do you actually get traction with government? I mean, at the end of the day, the government need to take an interest, and more importantly, implement the recommendations. How, how, does, how is that actually brought about in practical terms? Well, I mean, the process is that the government has to reply to us and they've replied to us. And on the, 
several of the things we've had a positive reply on the core thing of planning it's a bit more ambiguous is the polite way of putting it but mm. then there's the politics that's around at the moment and i think what we've said will contribute to where hopefully where the secretary of state ends up um and there was some, some positivity i think in the leveling up white white paper um and then there's a debate in the chamber we've got a queue at the moment because since covid there's been a lot of legislation that's been taking up all our time but we will get a chance to debate the report in, in September or October. And I hope that people, including the 500 people on this call, uh, will start you know, writing in and making a fuss because that does make a difference. I mean, once you've got things in Parliament, like we've been dealing with the building safety bill, and you know, I've had a lot of letters and so has everybody else. And I think that does help, um, both in, obviously particularly in the Commons, but also in the Lords because we can... You know, we can persuade through technical excellence, if you like. And some of these points, like the resourcing of planning departments, are a technical matter. They're not really that divisive. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've got a question with regard to how we uh, move things forward, which follows on from Sasha's. But j j just before I do, um, just picking up a couple of points from, from our viewers. One of the points that's been made by our viewers is that planning risk, which is the meat and drink to, say, the strategic land companies that will operate on that basis, is the killer for SMEs, um, because SMEs just can't necessarily yeah. run the risk of two applications and knowing that one's going to fail and all the funding that goes into that. Um, so uh, exactly uh, supporting what you're saying. Um, uh, my, my question is really that some of the more obvious um, comments that have been made following the white paper um, and which are very much a theme that, that come through what, what your work has, has done, Baroness, is there are changes that we can make to the system without primary legislation, amendments to the PPG, things yep. that we can do to the MPPF, which just don't require parliamentary time, which D, uh, DLUHC could, could do tomorrow. You know, thing, things such as uh, changing the cost circular. So if a council refuses consent for an allocated site and loses, then the presumption could be for them to prove that they've behaved reasonably rather than the other way around. Um, yeah. Or to have standard policies that, if they're just adopted in a local plan, they're presumed to be sound. And you don't have to examine them. Exactly. Uh, there's lots and lots of things. Uh, Steve Quartermain's written extensively on this. So, how on earth do we galvanise both the public sector and the private sector to come forth and 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 tell government that this is the obvious interim solution, rather than this constant sense of drift we've got about whether reform is or isn't happening? Yeah, and Steve has given evidence to us. I mean, I think the honest truth is a very good challenge. I think we should really gather together a list of what these things are and, and present them to Stuart Andrew and, and Michael Gove and, and publicise them and say we can do these things. I mean, we made huge changes on planning in the 80s when I worked on, on the planning changes. I was at De what was then DEFRA, uh, what, what's now DEFRA, and um, it was fascinating. I mean, Nick Ridley made some changes, and he just made them overnight in a draft PPPG. I mean, I, I'm sure it was discussed a little bit in cabinet, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the way it was, and it was put out to consultation. Then it immediately changed the treatment of, at that time, agricultural land and how that should be viewed within the planning system. So it is very powerful, the planning system. You can make changes. And I mean, I think there are, there, there are things that you can do to force people to do local plans and things like fast tracking for SMEs, um, extra uh, proposals on what you do about how, housing the elderly and therefore perhaps releasing homes, you know, the bed blocking effect of, of homes because elderly people don't want to move out. These sort of things can actually be done without legislation. It's pretty clear that the planning bill, the generic planning bill is not coming back in its current form. We're mm -hmm. going to get some planning in the levelling up white paper, I think, and the, therefore eventually presumably in a levelling up bill. Um, but that's going to be some way off. So, and then actually speeding things up. You don't actually need any legislation. You need more people in the, in the right town halls or to, or to share expertise in design and environmental matters and all the rest of the things that's holding everything up. Well, well to give you a direct example of that, before I hand back to the Chuckle Brothers, um, it, one, one, of the, one of the issues that, that I've had three inquiries now this year, and we're only in March, um, debating how you deal with education provision. The obligation mm -hmm. section of PPG is almost completely unhelpful on that, and it relies upon guidance from, from DfE that they've been promising to publish for the last for the last four years. You know, th th it's just guidance. It's just things that could be done without the need for any involvement of any of the politicians. Just getting it right. 
I mean, and that should be on our list. And in a sense, you, one of the cases we were talking about, that the transport people, I think you said, hadn't turned up or they hadn't put in their opportunity to object. Mm -hmm. So it's almost if people don't object or don't have guidance, then there should be some sort of presumption that you can go ahead and that it shouldn't slow the system. I don't know if there's any scope for that. Um, but because um, there is an awful lot of people get involved in planning. And if you haven't got a local plan, which has sorted all of that out beforehand, it's a tremendously slow. And other countries manage to move ahead quicker. Perhaps they aren't so democratic, but um, <laughs> there is. <laughs> One of our viewers had a comment saying he's watching from Mexico. Tony is a very good friend of the show. And he said, yes, I don't think they have quite the same problems there. They do have perhaps a few other problems. <laughs> Mary, <laughs> what's your question? Well, can I just first of all start by saying I, 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 I think it's very interesting that there's such a lot of support for what you're saying on the comments. I mean, Paul's just picked up on this uh, uh, SME point, but also the, po the points about uh, speeding up local plans. I actually had a query in today from someone who they've constructed nine homes and there's a planning condition um, that requires dis the discharge before the homes can be occupied. He's waited a year. He is bleeding money. So I, I, I really feel that we, we need to get our heads together and think of a more imaginative way in which we could incentivize councils to get on with the discharge of conditions. Because we all talk about planning permissions, but that's only a, a, the half of it. There's then a whole list of conditions that uh, require discharging. And that process, again, it can be extraordinarily lengthy. And it's not really an answer to, to for, for, for me for people to appeal against the failure to discharge. Um, what they need is is quicker action on, on the part of the council, or, or at least a system, I suppose, which which says if you haven't discharged it by X, then it's a deemed discharge. Um, oh. Although, well, in a way, the trouble with that is it just ends up creating a system where the council look has to priority uh, prioritise what's important, and it sort of squeezes them more in terms of resource. But something has to give because you know this this SME builder is saying to me, "Where can I get recompense for for, for the costs that the increase in costs as a result of the incompetence of the council?" Anyway, I digress. Sorry. Well, I'd be interested in details on that one because that does sound yeah. exactly the sort of thing we don't want. I mean, COVID's had a delaying effect, you know, on a lot of things. Um, if you try to, um, you know, if you've got, okay. a, if you've got, a, if you've got a will to discharge, I it's very, that. very slow. I buy that a little, but hey, a, yeah. a, a lot of us are, are finding that we can work even more effectively from home where we don't spend an hour a day travelling. So oh. I can't see why the public sector isn't isn't catching up a little bit on that, um, if that doesn't sound too harsh. Anyway, my question is this. In the run-up to the elections, we seem to be seeing a reluctance in some quarters to accept local plan inspectors' recommendations. You mentioned... Um, you mentioned slightly different point. You mentioned Slough being withdrawn, um, but Castle Point, who had recommend had recommendations from an inspector to make their uh, plan sound, um, the members there um, a few days ago decided to reject effectively that those recommendations and withdraw the plan. But I also want to draw attention to what's going on in Welling, where there's been an exchange of correspondence with the council writing to the new housing minister and the minister not replying and effectively leaving it to the, constituents M the constituency MP who was copied in, in this case, Grant Schatz, to reply. And, and, and really, I'm, I'm, my question is this, isn't it rather remiss of the housing minister not to respond to the point, really, that uh, the independent examination process is, is just that, and that, you know, the, the, the councils, once they've submitted these plans, they need to respect the, pro they need to respect the process. It's enormously frustrating um, for, for, for participants in Castle Point who have got housing allocations in the green belt now to find that on, on the face of it, they're back to square one. Um, and this is a council, by the way, that was put on the naughty step by Sajid Javid. So mm -hmm. don't we need to see more examples of the government giving a clear steer on the need for local plans to be up to date? Well, <laughs> you take the words out of our mouth. I mean, that's exactly what we said. We want the local plans to be up to date. It's very interesting that, of course, Grant Shapps was the housing minister for two years and five months. So he obviously understands the system very well. And um, local MPs do 
they do sort of depart from government policy in my experience they write in on their local on their local planning things and it, that just seems to be what happens but then i think brave ministers need to sit back and they need to come to the right solutions in, a, in an agreeable amount of time i'm glad you mentioned welling garden because my um great uncle was an architect, Louis de Soissons, and he um, designed Welling Garden City. Um, ah. So obviously, um, I have a great emotional attachment to it. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. Back to you. Back, back to the, um, the brothers. I hope people are done for your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, we really enjoyed your report. Yeah. It is a really impressive report. I think the fact that you've said the theme should be more housing and less housing ministers is true. Just, just look at this, OK? This is what's happened in the 20 years. Lord Broughton, he was there for a year. Lord Rooker, he was there for a year. Keith Hill, he managed two years. Yvette Cooper, three years. Caroline Flint, not even a year. Margaret Beckett, about five months. John Healy, about a year. Grant Shapps, two years. Mark Prisk, not even a year. Chris Hopkins, <laughs> that was a year. Brandon Lewis, that was two years. Gavin Barwell, that was a year. Akok Sharma, that was a year. Dominic Rapp, that was about five minutes. Kit Malthouse, that was a year. Uh, Esther McVeigh, that was a few months. Chris Pincher, he was good, wasn't he? Chris Pincher. Very good. Stuart Andrew. Well, he's been there for more than five minutes. Now, how can you run a department when you change them 18 times in 20 years? I mean... See, he's yeah. not doing this for your benefit, by the way, Baroness. He does this every week. This is this <laughs> stocky trade. He can do that in cross-examination as well. But my question, though, is that you're spot on. It's ridiculous. You can't run... You can't... You know, I've worked for Tesco's as well. They had a, you know, people at the top who stayed there for 20 years and they ran it brilliantly. Now, my question, though, is about specialist accommodation for older people. Your report, one of the most powerful things that you say is the need for a lot more of this accommodation. In Australia and New Zealand, it's 13% of the accommodation for the over 65s. In the United States, it's 17%. In this country, it's 1%. Please, can we help you to provide updated guidance to give the government the answer in updated guidance because at the moment it refers to the app shop tool which is just based on existing prevalence rates it's pointless it doesn't do anything effective there are a number of experts we could direct you to who will and arco have even instructed that's the umbrella organization for extra care have even instructed an expert academic to produce a report Please, can we share this with you and work with you to give the government a practical example of implementing what I think is your most powerful recommendation in terms of the desperate, critical need for more specialist accommodation for elderly people? Well, we'd be absolutely delighted. And um, it, the, the door is open on this. We said in our report we need a new national planning gut framework, wherever it might be, on, on housing for the elderly. Um, both specialist and non-specialist. Um, and of course, the government set up a task force on housing for the elderly. So if we can come up with a sensible, simple solution that is easy for them to do, I think that is the sort of change that one could get. You don't need even to do a private member's bill, because I think, back to my earlier points, we can do it through planning legislation, which has a lot of delegated powers. Yeah. So... Let's, let's work together on the housing for the elderly. You know, our population is ageing. One in four people in the UK will be over 65 by 2050. Um, and that's, you know, that's a quarter of the, a quarter of the nation. And it's a, a huge, huge, huge problem for housing as well as for social care. Yeah. It doesn't even need legislation. It's just the PPG. It just needs to set some kind of figure. And we can, we can help you with that. Yeah, well, we look for, I look forward to a, I look forward to a draft in my entry on Monday morning. I can pretend I'm back at Tesco. That's blown the dinner. That's blown the dinner. <laughs> uh, on that note, Branson, well, thank you so much indeed uh, for joining Thank it's you. A genuinely enlightening discussion. Um, yes. You've stimulated a huge number of comments. 
Um, and so please do keep in touch. We'll keep in touch with you in any way we can help you and your committee with its work on this. We'd be delighted to. Well, thank you. And thank you for asking me onto your program um, you, and for such constructive, constructive comments. It's, it's a delight. Thank you. You definitely had the best backdrop of any, any guest on our show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's because I, lo I love heritage and I love design. There you are. <laughs> Superb. Well, we're, we're taking a, an Easter break now um, to a return date to be negotiated between the four of us because the different ones of us on different holidays differ, on different Thursdays for next month. But we will let you all know, dear viewers, in due course, which Thursday we come back. Um, and um, in the meantime, it's, um, it's good night for me. And it's good night from him. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. Happy Easter. Happy yeah. Easter. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Bye-bye.